And uh, I know everybody hopefully enjoying breakfast. I expect you to continue to enjoy your breakfast. Uh, we'll, we'll power through the uh, clinking. <clears throat> no, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. I tested uh, negative. So, <clears throat> but I do have a little bit of a frog in my throat. So anyway, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we wanted to put this uh, briefing together. Uh, obviously, a lot of concern, uh, a lot of questions unanswered, a lot of questions that can be answered. Um, but we've been focused on this COVID-19 issue uh, actually going back to January. That's when uh, our health and safety division began to develop our toolkit uh, to begin posting the information available at the time, uh, to continuously be updating that information. Uh, they've been engaged with uh, CDC, the World Health Organization, NIOSH, John Hopkins Occupational Health Program. We've had conference calls with healthcare professionals uh, on several occasions across the country. And um, we certainly began to drill down on our focus as the issue unfolded in Washington State and with our members who uh, ended up uh, being uh, quarantined. And so I just want you to know that your IFF has been really focused on this issue. And, and our intent today is simply to provide some information this morning, as updated as we have it, uh, to be able to guide you to the toolkits and the resources that we have developed, um, and really to do a more deep dive. Uh, I, I want to bring up uh, our, my assistant, Pat Morrison, who really has been heading up our entire uh, health and safety team. Uh, but I just want to make sure you know that we've been engaged, and you'll be hearing from our state leadership in Washington State, but we've been engaged with our state leadership, our local leadership, and certainly uh, continue to use all of the various uh, healthcare organizations and professionals to make sure that what we're pushing out to you is accurate information. You know, we don't want to be naive and, and not be prepared or help you to be prepared, but we also don't want to add to the, I don't want to say the hysteria, but we don't want to add to and help to push uh, any more of a panic uh, than is necessary, if you will, or, or hopefully not even uh, necessary at all. So, Pat, if you want to come up and really walk us through, kind of take us back to January, take us through what we've developed, what we've been providing, and then we'll start with some of our very uh, special guests who will share with you their perspective and their own respective roles. So Pat, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, back in January when we started to take a look at this, and we really were looking at it very closely in December when this virus um, started the word coming out of China, and we've already had, and a lot of you in the room here too, have already had some experience with SARS. We looked at the Ebola. We looked at, you know, a lot of those emerging diseases. What have we done in the past? What do we need to do? And we realized um, early on that we needed to get prepared and we needed to start to prepare. And we needed, in January, we really sat down and started to put these programs together. My colleague, Jim Brinkley, Assistant to the General President for Technical Assistance and Information Resources, his staff, along with an incredible staff in health and safety, that really just said, listen, how do we focus? How do we put this together? What do we need to um, actually get prepared prior to this? And then, lo and behold, um, basically February 28th is when we got the call from Washington State that basically said that they had just transported the first patient that tested positive and had died from this virus. And right there, it started to um, really have a, a magnified issue for all of us. All those things that you prepare for, all those things you sit down, everything that you have written now becomes real. This is a case study going on. And we really kind of want to walk you through that case study because early on we had a lot of areas. We thought we had the information, but things change rapidly, and especially when guidance is coming out, misinformation is coming out. What do you do? How do you take care of your members? What do you do for quarantine? What is your uh, PPE protection? 
What do you mean we're going to go in isolation? I'm going to be away from my family. What is it that we need for testing? Why can't I get tested? Where are those resources? Am I going to get protected? Am I going to get paid? All these things came into Washington State, and, uh, and really it, it hit at a rapid, rapid pace that we want to kind of walk through today. We want to give you sort of a, a, a where, where, are, where have we been, where are we now, and where do we need to get ready in the future. And you really have to take a listen to this, because I think the information here, um, you're going to really look and take back and start to prepare. Do not wait. Do not think that this is just something that's going to go away. It is not. It is a pandemic. It will hit your local. And you do have time to start to prepare those resources, those guidance, and sitting down. So with that, you have the agenda. It is on your table. And we're going to kind of go through that um, this morning. But first, I want to introduce um, somebody that really, um, from the beginning when this hit, uh, basically, we had that phone call that Saturday morning, and we have literally been working since uh, for 12 consecutive days on this. And that, that phone call, basically, we have been in contact almost every single day on this. And um, Dennis Lawson, who's president of the Washington State Council of Firefighters, um, basically has been on the phone with the governor, health officials, local affiliates, his leadership in so many different areas in Kirtland, um, I don't know the union uh, president, I don't know if Brian is here, but uh, Brian um, Badley, but just incredible, incredible um, local affiliate from Kirkland uh, was, was charged with that first, having to make those decisions. But Dennis actually was walking through his, his guidance, um, what he has done, what he continues to do has just amazed me. So we're going to start this morning off with Dennis Lawson giving us that overview and that presentation. So please welcome Dennis Lawson. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to say uh, thanks to the IFF for the opportunity to uh, share our story in the state of Washington. And as Pat mentioned, it is unfolding by the hour. Uh, as he mentioned, Brian Badney, a local president from Kirkland, Washington, uh, I'm not sure if he's actually sleeping anymore because I'm getting emails and phone messages throughout the night. He has worked very, very hard on behalf of his membership, so thanks to Brian. Pat mentioned uh, on Friday evening, February 28th, uh, we received notification from District Vice President Walsh that we had suffered our first fatality in the state of Washington. And this fatality came out of Kirkland, Washington. And so we thought we would have a conference call. We scheduled that conference call for Saturday morning. So at the time, it wasn't going to be you know, some, uh, some concerns. Some of our issues would be discussed and how we would move forward. Uh, little did we know, early that morning, late on Friday night, uh, the city of Kirkland had placed in quarantine uh, initially a number of firefighters. And uh, what had happened after that uh, was it changed really the, the size and really the scope of what we were going to talk about. The initial numbers of firefighters in quarantine were from local 2545 were 17 members. Redmond Fire local 2829 had seven members and Woodenville Fire local 2950 had three members. And so let me just kind of help set the stage a little bit on what this looks like. Kirkland Fire has five stations, 20 as the minimum staffing, and 95 shift personnel. Remember, I just told you 17 of which now have now been removed. Redmond Fire has seven stations with 32 as the minimum staffing level and 155 total members. And Woodenville Fire has three stations with 12 as the minimum staffing level and 52 total response personnel. And if you start to look at these numbers, and I will update you right now, I'll just share it right now, um, Kirkland has 31 members in quarantine right now. 31 out of 95. It's a third of their workforce is not at work right now. You can see how this exposure and subsequent actions to quarantine can impact our ability to provide service to our communities. If you've never been to Washington, Kirkland lies within King County, King County, Washington, home of Seattle, home of the Seattle Seahawks, uh, it's 11 miles northeast of Seattle. On a good day, 11 miles, that's probably a half hour drive. On a bad day, that's probably two hours. King County is home of Medic One program. I think most of have heard that program is regarded as one of, if not the best, EMS programs in the world. They take very great pride in who they are and what the work they do. The locals and departments initially involved 
I would consider or classify as being very progressive, strong leadership, strong department presence. Many of the local, uh, the department leaders have came through their uh, local ranks, have maybe held office, so they understand the importance of the relationships. Uh, the local presidents there, Brian Vadney, as we mentioned, from Kirkland, Ted Klinkenburn from Woodenville, Gary Anderson from Redmond, Redmond, and Andrew Altman from Bellevue have been engaged and responsive to our request. And I think when I talk about being engaged, it's understanding the issues, where to find some of the res resources, but responsive to us is very important. If we need information, we can actually call and we're going to be assured that they're actually going to pick the phone up. That's important. Or, vice versa, when they call, we need to be able to answer the phone for them. That provides comfort and some security. So prior to this event, most if not all dispatch centers would ask questions related to world travel. Have you been to China? Have you been to Italy? Have you, do you have the flu? And may have left it at that. The question came down on the type of PPE and why would we have had exposures in the state of Washington if they're wearing the PPE? Let me give you an example. 60-year-old male fall patient. All right, 60-year-old male fall patient. Gloves, goggles. As you arrive, you start your patient assessment, feverish, diarrhea, vomiting, 102 degree temperature. Clearly, it's not just a fall patient any longer. But you initially started that treatment with maybe gloves and goggles on. Quickly, we have to change the way we're doing business. So one of the positives that we were able to do right away was to simply get in and start asking different questions, drilling down on those family members when they call 911 to make sure that we have the appropriate information so our responders can do what they need to do. As I mentioned, we're going to do a conference call on that Saturday morning. And on that Saturday morning, as I mentioned, the conference call that grew in size and, of course, in severity. General President Schaeberger, IFF senior staff, state council leadership and committee chairs were on this line to discuss what had occurred and what needed to take place in the future. The initial focus was on our members, where it should always be, who were in quarantine as well as their families. We had one member who had a pregnant wife who was due at any time. Uh, we had other members who had kids at home, wanted to stay there. And where were we going to put these firefighters? As I, I mentioned, they initially said that they were going to be quarantined. And we were fortunate enough to, that at least Kirkland initially said, we'll allow you to ch a choice. Quarantine at home, we'll provide a place for you to go stay, or you can stay at a fire station. We recognized that this was going to grow. We talked about getting back on the phone with each other, continuing to update and provide information as we move forward. Some initial actions. Reviewed and shared the IFF toolkit. Now, by a show of hands, I'm going to ask you honestly, how many of you actually read the toolkit before this hit here in Washington? That's pretty much what I thought. And we have to figure out how to do better at that. Uh, I'm one of the guys as well. I saw the link. I saw it on the website page. But I did not drill down into that until Saturday morning, which was a problem. You know, I own that one. I should have had better responsibility. I should have been knowing exactly what was going to take place. Wasn't thinking it was actually going to hit our neighborhood coming to you right next door, and that's really what happened. Quarantine or isolation, what was the difference? Quarantine for those who are believed to have been exposed, but not yet showing signs or symptoms of the flu. And these are important terms. Isolation, I'm sorry, quarantine period was set at 14 days. Isolation, for those who begin to show flu-like symptoms and test positive. And so when people initially were, may have been exposed to that first patient, they were set aside, quarantined, they set a time frame of 14 days, which we're rapidly approaching, and then those, if we had any by chance that had tested positive, they were also in that time frame as well. Fire departments and health departments uh, allowed quarantine members to quarantine at home at the fire station. Preferred method would be staying at home. You're, you're within, your, within your own residence, some comfort there. Obviously, they said that you need to maintain uh, a distance of six, six feet from your family members, which could be difficult. Some chose to go to the fire station. Now, going to the fire station and choosing that as a quarantine location works great maybe for the individual, but not so good for the operation of the department. What they found was is they moved people in there who they believe were quarantined, and yet they realized they have to maybe get the personal belongings of the people who are coming back on shift the next day. All the gear that was inside there that they thought they, you know, maybe were, again, focused on those members, but they still had bunker gear, they had personal belongings, they may have had car keys inside that station for other people, so retrieving that information was something that was an afterthought. Uh, I think that at that point they had actually went in, hired a crew, brought out personal belongings, deconned everything, and then made it available for their members. Identifying an appropriate PPE uh, was important. Develop the message to provide confidence. Confidence for our members to understand if you wear the PPE, you may have been 
exposed to a patient, but you're personally not exposed, meaning your PPE is designed to give you that protection that we all want to see and we feel comfor comfortable having. Uh, social media for us was not huge. Um, we live in the day where we can put blasts out pretty much by the hour. I think the IFF has done a fantastic job of changing their messaging, updating their frequently asked questions. Our IFF State Council, as, as well as the IFF 7th District, we've also used, utilized our, our Twitter, our Instagram, Facebook, websites, anything we can put information uh, out. We also put joint letters out from DBP Walsh and myself to our membership. Ours to the state and uh, Ricky put his out across the 7th District, just to make sure everybody knew what we were doing, what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, briefed our ex uh, State Council Executive Board on the conference call to make sure everyone knew what was taking place and allowed questions and feedback, recognizing that we have some pretty smart people around the world, pretty smart people in the state of Washington, some very smart people on our Executive Board. And one of the things that we did a few years ago, which I think really fell, I mean, just in line right now made us feel much better is that we created a few committees, standing committees. We had a health and safety committee. Kevin Wojcicki is the chair of that, very, very knowledgeable on state laws, understands the, the, the operations of King County. Uh, we also had an EMS chair. And just having these individuals, our public relations, whoever it may be, having our district reps involved, Craig Susi from our, our executive board working right in that area, having people understand what is actually taking place, having the relationships with those in the county officials made a big difference. We have 11 board members and geographically spread across our state, about 8,500 members, about nine, yeah, between 8,500 and 9,000 members spread out and just making sure. When we talked to the IFF staff on day one, one of the most important things that we talked about was having a consistent message. If we did not stay consistent in our messaging, we were going to break. We were going to break apart and where we were not talking it would allow others to put their own information out, which was not only going to be problematic for us as members, problematic for our communities. Our communities were looking, for, looking to us for trust. They wanted to rely on us. We worked with others to find a path to move first responders up as a priority for testing. And I can tell you right now, it worked initially as a thought. What we thought was going to work to make sure the healthcare responders were provided when they went in for their testing, it may have worked for maybe the first couple days. We have received word this morning that we could not, we were waiting for 11 test results to come back. Those 11 test results now are considered expired. And so now they're talking about you know, maybe testing them again. The reality is at this point in the game, 12 days into it, probably not gonna have a good test. And so we gotta make, continue to make sure that we work with our Department of Health, our uh, EMS providers, as far as the counties, cities, whoever it may be. Uh, we continue to work with our uh, hospitals to be notified of patients who are testing positive. Now this is something that we actually may need a little help on. Because what's happening right now is, is some people may be at home, they uh, develop flu-like symptoms, they go to the hospital and they test positive. What is the circle back around? What brings that information back to you as first responders? Because you may have been there three or four days ago. You may not have been the transporting agency. It may have been POV, it could have been a private ambulance. And if the hospital care uh, providers, the admitting people, are not asking those questions and it's not coming back to us, we may have exposed members who don't even know about it. So that's something we can continue to work on. Uh, we worked with our elected officials, including our governor, Governor Jay Inslee, who, who is really a, a, a good man, a, a strong, strong individual who believes in worker rights, uh, maintains a good relationship with labor. He's done some very good things for us. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a place at all the tables. We don't want labor to be an afterthought. So if you have county EMS boards or county emergency management groups, or you have relationships that would meet with you, have senior staff of your municipality or your county's meeting, find a way to get at the table. I mean, as they say, if you're not, you're, if you're not at the table, you might, be, you might be the meal. You gotta make sure you're right there having people from the very beginning. Healthcare is always a concern for our members, and initially, our governor working through our uh, insurance commission uh, suspended pre-authorization for COVID-19 testing. So you did not have to go to a doctor and get one a prescription to go see somebody else. They suspended that. They waived the copay and deductibles for COVID-19. Uh, and then they also softened the lines for testing regarding this network versus out-of-network response. So if we have members who live in a certain area and they had a doctor who was not considered a network, they waived that fee as well. We worked with our Department of Labor and Industries to make sure that our, our members are covered, so our worker comp. This was done and uh, applied to all workers initially. We do have some concerns related to this, but I, I'm, I'm hoping we can continue to do good things. Uh, when we put somebody off on paid or uh, quarantine, initially they were put on what we call paid administrative leave. 
full benefits, no loss of time, not using sick leave. This was basically as a result of being at work. And uh, I think those departments initially took that action. We've had a little pushback. We will continue to work with our state chiefs to make sure that this uh, continues to be addressed. Uh, Kirkland and others have had a new run report code numbers. So how many of you sit back at the fire station, enter a code, you went on a certain call type, and you entered you know, whatever would be shortness of breath. If you're not capturing the shortness of breath calls, how do you know who to find out and who to follow up with as well? As I mentioned, part of that responsibility falls on the hospital or the members there or the admitting clerks, but what about us? Can we make sure that we're doing uh, the, the appropriate or taking the appropriate action to make sure that if we code you know, these appropriately, and I believe they're actually created a, a code in Kirkland, you know, CVD, so if they think that patient has that, they can actually go back and do some follow-ups, which I think would be helpful. Um, created an interlocal agreement, and this is huge too. So in the state of Washington, we have municipalities, we have what they call county fire departments, and we have regional fire authorities. It's kind of a consortium. And what happens is, is that we, we were concerned initially about crossing lines, staffing. Again, 31 members out of 95 taken out of Kirkland. What happens when they can't staff the appropriate apparatus? Of course, we want our Kirkland members, and I know that the Kirkland's brothers and sisters, they want to be able to help their communities. They want to be the first ones there to take care of what needs to be taken care of. But if they can't, what does that look like? So creating an interlocal agreement allowed us uh, to at least have a playing field where our locals would operate together and they would have kind of just a baseline how they're going to move forward. It also allowed us to create contract language uh, to address some of our concerns. Uh, testing established, a, uh, this is actually an interesting story. So when we were talking about our testing, they established a drive-through testing program. Uh, I think Pat mentioned one day, can you get a latte there? No, you cannot get a latte through this drive-through. But what you can do is you go through a parking garage. And they actually you set up ahead of time, you go through the parking garage, and they would come to the window. They'd have you roll your windows down ahead of time, you'd roll up to the spot, they would reach in the windows, they'd do your swabs, they take them, they put them in a cylinder, and you drive away. Well, parking garages, six foot 11. One of the individuals, the truck was seven foot three. So, yeah, it didn't work so. He actually stopped, they had to create, a, they were creative on the way they were gonna do this, came up the back stairwell, still got tested. Uh, but those are the kind of little things that we had to overcome. Uh, this last Friday, DPP Walsh and I met with the local leaders from Kirkland, Bellevue, Woodenville, and Redmond. Actually went to the Life Care Center facility. And while we were there, we just wanted to see what was happening, what did it look like, what was the neighborhood, just to kind of see what was taking place. And then within about two minutes while we're there, here comes the response vehicles for an aid call. And uh, we initially kind of pushed ourselves back. We saw the Redmond, I'm sorry, the uh, Kirkland folks moving in, had a battalion chief rolled right in. Uh, the initial actions of the battalion chief was to tie in with the coordinator of the hospital, make sure really what was, what was going to take place. Who were they going to see? They were actually not going into the facility any longer. There was a breezeway, they were bringing patients out. They were treating them outside with the best they can and then moving them into a, a transport unit, whether that would be a medic unit or a, an ambulance, a, a BLS type service. And uh, it was, it was, I was amazed. I was actually quite proud to see what was taking place. Uh, our brothers and sisters do a really good job. Future challenges and things to work on, and there are quite a few. As Pat mentioned, we have, uh, we've learned a lot in just a very short period of time. Things we could do different, definitely. And we've been sharing those and we've been making those available to the IFF and to their FAQs. Continue to look and work on those things. For those who have collective bargaining agreement, an early request to bargain is important. And when I say that, not only just the impacts and the effects, but we should also be discussing the decision. Why are you going to do something and what are the impacts to our members? What does that look like? And a couple of those examples, what I talked about was conditions in which a member would be quarantined or isolated. Where are they going to stay? You know, initially they had in King County, the, uh, the King County government bought a building. It was an old motel. And they were going to house members or quarantined or isolated members in this motel. It does not have cooking facilities. So who is going to bring food? How are they going, if they have no wash and washers and dryers available, who's gonna clean their clothes? And so these are the kind of things, and that's why when I said having the option to stay at home is probably one of the best things we can do. Other things to think about for uh, negotiations. Uh, conditions to release, do they come immediately back to work? What is that time frame? What kind of leave are they gonna be on? Is that paid administrative leave? Is that their personal sick leave? Um, who pays the costs associated with the quarantine? Housing, food, medical. Uh, workers' comp, are they going to be placed on workers' comp? 
and then any additional safety equipment that needs to be uh, you know, provided to our members. These are the kind of things that if you start talking about now, if it hasn't hit you, start thinking about these things. Testing facilities need to be identified as soon as, po as, soon as possible and ready. They had one facility in the state of Washington. It was a CD center located in Shoreline, which was north of Seattle. They, since then, they up, put up and running, they put the University of Washington. As I mentioned, we had 11 results that were not done because they uh, were not, I guess, they're not valid at this point because they were not done in a timely fashion. So what do we need to do? My, my hope that is you'll all go back to your elected officials and say, we need to think about how we're gonna bring these up, make sure we have the equipment to test our people, move healthcare responders at the front of the line, and then also make sure that they have staffing to run the test. It does no good to have a building with nobody in it, just like no good to have a fire engine with nobody on it. Um, one of the things we also need to think about is people's perceptions of us, our families, how we interact with each other. We've already figured out, and they've talked and they shared this with Kirkland, is when the crews go to the grocery store, it looked a little bit different. People start to look at you a little bit different, maybe not move towards you as much as they used to, may not want to shake your hand. If you're coaching a, the season right now would be heading into baseball, if you're coaching a little league baseball team, maybe some of the kids don't want to play or your parents don't want them playing with your kids right now. Um, the birth of a child, very sad, but the, the individual who I mentioned, his wife was uh, pregnant, um, they had a shot for a new doctor because the doctor chose not to deliver that patient, deliver that baby. And those are the kind of things, those are real, those impact our members. Social media for our members, be aware of your postings. As local leaders, you might have some ability to post maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit negative, maybe some pointed comments, things like that, but our general membership does not have that, that right. They, they have to be very careful what they put out there. And some of the information, again, is, is confidential, so we need to be concerned about what they're putting out there. My suggestion, work through your DVPs, work through the IFF, through your communication department, make sure that they have all the, the, the appropriate messaging goes out. Again, consistent messaging. Uh, for those who have a current presumptive language, maybe we should look to expand this. Maybe we should look to expand the language that allows us better protection as we move forward. I know it's something we're gonna look for. And then we need to make sure that the federal uh, stockpile of PPE, and this is important. We actually talked yesterday, phone call into the governor's office. We understand they're releasing the PPE equipment. Where is it going? How are we getting it? Now we understand that we have a certain amount stockpiled at the federal government level, and we may have some left behind for our members inside your own department's cash, but we need to make sure that we get, that gets down to us. And we were told that a lot of that equipment's gonna go to healthcare providers, which includes our hospitals, nurses, doctors, as well as our care facilities. And we need to make sure that we have that as well, so we continue to ask for that. Um, with the recent approval by the federal government to make funding available, we need to make sure we follow the guidelines, work with the IFF to make sure if you have money coming back from the federal government to support staffing, we have to make sure that we actually take care of that. We may need to drive our employers a little bit. We may need to take some initiative and lead some of our employers in the right direction. Do not minimize the importance of this disease. I think that's something critical, you know. Um, <laughs> we go on a lot of calls. We do a lot of good things. This is important to our community. Our, our community is nervous. They're hurting. They don't know what's happening next. Quite honestly, they're very afraid. And so for us to can be, uh, continue to be compassionate, be professional as we do our work, continue to do the good things that we do. And then although this is new, it seems what's somewhat familiar. And I mean by responding to calls, taking care of the patient, protecting ourselves, reassuring our communities, and returning home to our families. That's really what it's about. This issue is highly likely to be with us for a while. We're not sure what it's gonna continue to do. Um, but I'm sure that we will adapt. We will once again be successful in our work. I'm grateful for all of you, your willingness to take a lead on this. And I say that because you will have to take a lead on this. And then finally, my sincere thanks to the IFF uh, for providing the leadership. As Pat mentioned, we have been on the phone since day one. We've talked daily, including his staff, Jim. And I want to thank, you know, just personally why I'm out here, General President Schaeberger, General Secretary Treasurer Ed Kelly, DVP Walsh, who's been yipping all the time at me, Pat Morrison, Jim Brinkley, Jane Bloom, Doug Stern, Mark Treglio, and Shanna Meisner for their support. If it wasn't for them willing to engage with us and allow us to share what we learned, I'm not sure you would have the same picture that we have right now. So stay, stay safe, stay strong, and stay union. Thank you, brothers and sisters.
Yeah, thank, thank you, Dennis. That was great, a great presentation. Um, we have been working with them, uh, District Vice President Ricky Walsh and that whole crew, the state, uh, the board, uh, the locals. It's been an incredible effort. Um, the reason Dennis was up here was because that started in, in, in that district. Any one of the affiliate leaders, any one of your state presidents could be up in front of this podium coming into the future because it is going to come and you're going to be uh, facing with this. The thing that we do know, and the general president put together, you know, our working team, and when we get down and when we sit set together and we work on, a, on an issue like this, it was every single division at the IFF had a piece to this. And you're going to start listening to those divisions and those reports. And we really want to go now into some of the uh, program particular items that we really feel that you're going to need uh, to take back with you. So what we have now, I'm going to introduce two of our next speakers. The first speaker is Aisha Rivera Margarin. She is uh, the John Hopkins Occupational Environmental Medical Residency Program. I think a lot of you know that we have a, a partnership for decades with John Hopkins, and that partnership continued. And it was so important to have that partnership, especially when we had this um, event unfolding. Right after Aisha, uh, Jim Brinkley, Assistant to the General President for Technical Assistance and Information Resources, is going to come up and talk about that protection. We had a lot of questions on PrEP, protections for firefighters, and for EMS. So our first speaker, I would like you to please welcome Dr. Rivera. Please come to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I want to appreciate um, the opportunity to be here to speak with you on this very important topic. I know that there is a lot of fear and concern out there, and it's understandable. You all are on the front lines, um, and it is very possible that um, you will be faced uh, with this uh, shortly if you haven't already. Um, so today I'm going to speak with you um, on just a few topics, signs, symptoms, and transmission of the disease. So the very first thing I want to say to you is that by far most people um, that have become infected with the disease don't actually have symptoms. Um, so that's a very important thing to keep in mind. If you were to be exposed to the disease, um, then uh, within 2 to 14 days of that exposure, if you were to develop symptoms, some of the things you might expect are things like fever, cough, shortness of breath. There have been reports of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, some GI distress. Uh, there have been reports of muscle cramps, muscle aches, fatigue, um, things that you might attribute to other things that may be running around in the community like flu or other respiratory illnesses. Now, importantly with this disease is that um, it can progress in a subset of individuals to more severe respiratory disease, um, such as pneumonia. And I was on a call last Thursday, um, which anyone can participate in these, in these calls if, you, uh, if that's something that's of interest. The CDC does these clinician outreach calls. Um, and uh, they, they noted that uh, the folks that develop more severe disease tend to develop it right around day eight of the disease. So right around the time when you might feel like you're getting better from whatever cold you've been experiencing for the past week is right when these folks tend to decline pretty quickly. And, and also important to, um, to keep in mind is that the individuals um, who would have the more severe disease are expected to be individuals over the age of 60. Uh, so there haven't been any major issues in, in Children, for example, we, we worry about children. Oftentimes we see them as a vulnerable population, but for whatever reason, um, this uh, disease doesn't seem to affect them symptomatically in the same way that it seems to affect individuals um, who are over the age of 60. And um, so I'm going to transition to the next slide because I'm sure everyone is concerned about transmission. So what there's still a lot for us to learn about the, uh, the virus, um, but what we do know um, is that it spreads person to person primarily. Um, and when we say person to person, we're talking about close contact within six feet. You've probably heard that six feet um, distance um, via respiratory droplets. Um, so that's, you know, if somebody sneezes or, or coughs, that, that droplet with the virus might go into the air and then 
come in, in contact with a, a surface on your body, such as your eye, your nose, your mouth. Um, it is possible that uh, some individuals may be transmitting and they may not know because there are folks that have the condition and, and don't necessarily have symptoms. Um, the other route of potential exposure is via surfaces, and that's why it's important to disinfect. Um, but that's not believed to be necessarily a primary route of exposure, or at least not the main route of exposure. Um, and then importantly, um, if there is community transmission in your community reported, and the way you would know that is you have to follow uh, your local and state health department um, guidance, um, then there may be a need to, be, to shift um, the efforts of your community from contact tracing to um, uh, self-monitoring, where folks are sort of uh, taking their temperature and, and reporting whether or not they have symptoms um, before they um, do things like come to work. And so um, it's really important that um, you uh, notify state and local public health authorities um, if you believe you, you've come in contact with a patient um, who could be classified as a person under investigation, and there's specific uh, definitions for that. Um, it's also really important that you notify your chain of command. So you, I think everyone in this room probably knows their, their chain of command, but making sure that your colleagues, that other folks know the chain of command, and to self-isolate if you have symptoms and notify your occupational health doctors. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Jim Brinkley. I'll leave you with some summary and resources, um, and also the, the caveat that this is a rapidly evolving situation, um, that the guidance may change um, as we learn more. So it's really important to apply universal precautions, making sure that um, we wash our hands and do things that we would do with any other virus. Um, so everybody should be washing their hands and um, exercising cough etiquette and all those things we would normally do and have worked so well for us over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Just an incredible partnership that uh, I, sh I should mention, our relationship with Johns Hopkins. That was through Convention Action. Uh, uh, more than 25 years ago. So something you, the, the IFF members, voted for many years ago that's paying huge dividends for us now. I'm gonna walk you through some things you can do before the call, during the response, and after the response to help protect you, your members, and your family. But if you don't remember anything else that is said from this podium today, remember to go check the IFF website, the COVID-19 resource that we've developed. Not only are our members checking that resource, but other fire service organizations are checking it. The fire chiefs are looking at it. Other labor groups are looking at it. And the reason they're turning to our resource is because we were ahead of the curve. I'm sure others will develop some very comprehensive resources for their groups, but right now we are the go-to source. We were ahead of the CDC, we were ahead of the World Health Organization, and if you're not going to that website, you're missing a critical piece in protecting yourself and your members. Let me start with talking about before the response. And you heard Dennis go through a number of items that they've been able to coordinate with their fire chiefs, with their public health organizations, with the governor. These are things you need to start working on now. It may not be in your community yet, but trust me when I tell you it is coming. And the sooner you get ahead of this, the better off you're gonna be. And one of the key elements is the PPE. Yes, we need to make sure that we have our members have the ability to be on administrative leave, not using their sick leave. But we also need to make sure we have the proper equipment to protect our members. Dennis talked about the stockpile. Where is that equipment in your community? Where is it in your state? And how do you get access to it? And this is a key point that came up on a call yesterday. I know our mentality. I know what some of you are gonna do. You're gonna go and try to get as much equipment as you possibly can. Probably more N95s than you will ever use in a lifetime. But then you're shorting the community next to you. So it's important that this is a balanced approach. And that's what they're doing in the state of Washington. All the communities are talking to each other, all the public health agencies are talking to each other and making sure that there's 
equitable distribution across the state, and that's a key piece. One of the comments we're hearing, one of the big fear things that's out there is that the N95 is not sufficient. Well, that's absolutely false. We've looked at the research, we have the information on our website, not only our policy statement on N95s, but all of the studies that back up our claim that the N95 is sufficient protection against COVID-19. In fact, there are some public health officials that are looking towards going towards, uh, leaning towards going with surgical masks. Now, we're not there yet, either it's the CDC and either it's the World Health Organization. But regardless of what we currently have on that website, I want you to set a reminder on your calendar to go there every morning and every afternoon because that's how nimble we are. That's how much we are paying attention to the ever-changing conditions and updating our resource, and you should be doing the same thing. Dennis mentioned the dispatch procedures. That's a key priority. All of the members that were initially impacted in the state of Washington wore the proper PPE for the information they were given at the time of dispatch. They would have answered the calls correct, they answered the questions correctly when they were on the phone with the call taker, but our members still walked into a situation where they were exposed. We were ahead of the curve in saying you need to change dispatch protocols, and CDC ultimately followed with interim guidance. You should be working with your community now to make sure that those dispatch protocols mirror what we have on the IFF website. And we talked about the leave provisions. I just want to get a little clarity on what quarantine and isolation really are. Initially, when you talk about quarantine and the ability to quarantine at home, the concern is I'm bringing this back to my family. Quarantine is simply limiting your travel, limiting your, your movement around the community. We want you to stay in one location, avoid spreading the disease to anyone else should you have it, but you can still be at home Keep that six foot distance. No one needs to wear PPE when they come into the room with you as long as they maintain that distance. Isolation is the next step. That's when you're symptomatic. That's when we believe you may have the disease. You may not have been tested yet or showing signs and symptoms. Then we want isolation and no one comes into the room without proper PPE. That's the biggest difference. And yes, we do believe that quarantine at home is the best thing for our members for all the reasons that Dennis mentioned. Now let's talk about some of the things you can do during the response. We talked about changing the dispatch protocols. What we want you to do is, do is assume that any patient with these signs and symptoms are infected. And make sure that you not only have the proper PPE, but you're donning it prior to entering that area. And you know what, we're, we're pretty good at that. You know where we find the most cross-contamination, the most infection? This was prevalent with the Ebola outbreak, and we're seeing it now with uh, COVID-19, and that's when we doff our PPE. So you should walk through the steps of how you put all the PPE on, but more importantly, how do you take it all off without cross-contamination? We're emphasizing that an initial assessment with the patient should be from a distance of six feet or more, and you should limit the number of members exposed. We know we operate in teams for safety reasons, but that doesn't mean that you have to be on top of each other or on top of the patient. Maintain a safe distance, limit the exposure, one person doing the initial assessment from six feet away, the other member close behind will go a long way to protecting and stopping the spread of the virus. Surgical masks for the patient if it's tolerated and promote good ventilation. And this is key when you're transporting in unit, units where the driver's cab is not separated from the patient compartment. Assuming that both members were in proper PPE during packaging and loading the patient, now what do you do with that driver in full PPE? We are recommending that you take off the gown, you take off the goggles, the gloves, wash your hands, but leave the N95 in place. If you're breathing the same air that is in that patient compartment, you need to maintain respiratory protection. When you arrive at the hospital or the care facility where you're transferring that patient, then the driver needs to put on the gown, the gloves, and the goggles once again for transferring that patient. 
Those are some key things that you can do right now to protect your members. And again, these are the recommendations today while I'm standing here. This afternoon, that may change. Make sure you go back to the website and check as we change our response. After the response, I talked about dolphin being the critical issue. Uh, there's some decontamination procedures on the, the screen. The main thing is we do not want you taking this home to your families. I think we've all gotten pretty good about avoiding taking carcinogens home to our families. You need to think of this as in the same way. You don't want your family to get cancer. You don't want them to get COVID-19. Yes, the young and the healthy, they're going to be fine. Do you want to take this home to mom or grandma or someone immune compromised? Make sure you're doing everything you can to decontaminate and not bring this home to your families. And we want to make sure you take care of you. We know those with weakened immune systems are most susceptible. How can you protect you? The rest, the hygiene, nutrition, and yes, behavioral health. Of all the members that we talked to in Kirkland, Redmond, Woodenville, I can tell you the biggest thing I heard on the phone, what raised my alarm, was their mental health. The anxiety I heard on the other side of that line. It wasn't that they were sick. It wasn't that they had signs or symptoms. The anxiety was the biggest concern for me at that moment. So if you need to talk to someone, that's where these peer support programs are vitally important. And if you're sick, please stay home. I think there's a culture in the fire service that we can handle anything, and we're going to come to work no matter what, because that's our duty, and we want to be there with our brothers and sisters. But I don't want you going to work, infecting someone else who then is going to take that home to their elderly parents or grandparents. And I've read the social media. I know there are going to be accusations that this is all hype. I've heard the, the statements that 70,000 people die from the flu every year. Why is this a big deal? 70,000 people dying from influenza with all of the awareness, with all of the immunizations, with all the public health campaigns, that's a problem. This doesn't have the same awareness. There is no immunization. And for the most part, people are not taking this seriously. So if you think 70,000 is a staggering number, Keep taking this lightly. We could very well be standing here next year talking about another emerging threat. And the discussion in the audience will be, they said this about H1N1, they said it about Ebola, and they said it about COVID-19. And guess what? It wasn't a big deal. The reason they don't become a big deal is because of the work we're doing here today because of these precautions. If we ignore it, if we take it lightly, we will set a new standard in the wrong direction for infectious disease in this country. Stay vigilant, go to the website, do the right thing. Thank you. Nice job, Jim, that presentation there. So as my slides get, uh, get on here. Um, what I do want to say, too, that I had, right before we started this, this um, whole event here, I had a local president from a large local come up to me and say that he reached out to his fire department, and the chief said, we, we really don't have to worry about it. We'll get to it. When we get to the quarantine, we'll figure it out as we get to it. And that was a large local. And I think what Jim had, had just said at the end of that, it is so important that you do not wait for your department to make those decisions. You are affiliate leaders. Make sure you get that information up top. If they're not moving, force their play. Um, I'm going to go over now just uh, some of the resources. I just kind of want to walk you through uh, quickly what we have, what you should be looking at. Jim had uh, highlighted some of those. But we really want to do some of the IFF uh, resources, our federal agency resources, and really those state and local. Here's the website. We've been talking a lot about this. Um, we put this together. Um, I cannot thank you know, uh, communications and, and working with us, getting this information up, getting it up in a timely way. But we've really broken it down to those breaking news. What's actually happening right now? What's going on? You can find that information out in that there. 
the latest protocols that we have there and the next one down, what we're doing is we are changing. I'm, I'm, this is not a stagnant event. It is, it is dynamic. It changes almost daily, as everybody has said up here. What we thought we had the best protection, we are changing it. We're getting more information. So this is where we look at what are those latest protocols? What do you need to do? What do you need to change? And how do you need to change? You have to be very, very nimble during this event. You just have to be. FAQs, this is, we really decided that um, when we had this event, and that was Saturday, we knew we had firefighters from Washington State, they were in quarantine, they didn't know what was going on, the local was, um, was worried about what was happening. We actually felt that the best way for us to get the information about exactly what was going on in quarantine was to have a conference call with those firefighters in quarantine. And that's what we actually did. We actually got them on the line and we said, okay, what, are you, what, what is going on? What are your worries? What are your concerns? What have, you, uh, what have you heard? What have you not heard? And what we decided to do is to take those. Because a lot of us, we can put a lot of information. It's difficult sometimes to digest all this. But a lot of times, a member is going to ask a question, and that question has already been asked, and we've already answered it here. So we update these on a regular basis. If something is changing, if there's a new protocol coming down, if CDC has made different recommendations, are we moving, are we shifting? We try to get that information in here, and this is real, real important for you to almost digest this in a way that you can get this information out to your members. Preparation uh, for first responders, Jim went over that, those, those changes. Even last night during the conference call that we had that we, with Washington State that we were on, they're looking at changing some protocols. They're looking at changing those procedures. They're looking at making that uh, different and making um, different recommendations. Um, what we have here is that we've had several protocol changes from CDC uh, to the dispatch. That was our biggest issue that we had. We had a couple things right away. Dispatch in Washington State, in Kirkland, was saying two questions. Did you travel to China? Do you know anybody? All the, the, um, the gentleman who, who, who died answered no to both of those questions. And several others after that said no to those questions. And we said, we've got the wrong protocol, CDC. We, this, this horse is out of the barn. We don't have those people are doing that, and they're coming down, and they are dying from this disease, so we need to change that protocol. Background in transmission and signs and symptoms, we've gone over that. This is something that you can take off the website. You can take it back, and you can, um, you can use it. The travel advisory. Um, again, we changed that travel advisory is that Dispatch should say that somebody that you're going to, the first responder, your members, you're going there, this is what they're displaying. So what do we say? PPE advised. What that means, it's cautious. It means get ready, put your PPE on when you're doing that assessment. Do not do it later. Do not delay. That's how you end up with more and more of our members in quarantine. The resources. We put all the resources that we have on this page. When we get a resource, we put it on here. You can take a look at that. You can see if you need information from that, but it's all in one location. Right now, every government agency and a lot of other people are putting the resources out there. We're trying to really synthesize that, get that down into a manageable level that you can actually use. Here are some infographics that uh, communications, um, they put together. These are uh, things that you can put on your social media. You can do this today. You can start to get this information out there. They're changing these. We're adding those messages that we really feel are important, but you can start to push that out there. And I think that you, we need to push that out there, and you need to be a part of that. The uh, CDC, um, our, our recommendations, this is where we go. This is where everybody is kind of shifted to. But you have to remember, we look at CDC, and we know they are the leading authority in here. But early on, we were really concerned with the testing. We were ahead of that curve. We said, where are the testing? Where are the results going to come? How can we get our members tested? Remember, they had in Kirtland, they had firefighters in quarantine. They started to show signs, so we had to move to isolation that we've described. And then in isolation, if they start to come down with those signs and symptoms that they've said they had, we want them tested right away. It took us 72 hours to get them tested. 72 hours. The delay was just way too long. And we're still having issues with the testing policies and procedures and getting those results back. And it's something that we've, we, uh, CDC needs to do a better job. The states are going to have to do a better job. And we're going to have to push that message. 
Here are some of the other guidance that came out. We actually changed, that top guidance was the change to the protocol for dispatchers to say, listen, you can ask about travel, but let's ask about those other flu-like symptoms. Let's move from that travel and let's move to what currently is actually happening. Not what you think, but what is currently actually happening. And all of these guidance memos are on, the, uh, are on our website. Um, this one, I think is, uh, let me just go back there too. That's, uh, and we have OSHA, we've been working with OSHA and NIOSH. And what Jim had said up here with NIOSH, we looked at the N95s, the effectiveness. We looked at all those studies. All that information is on the website. And then we looked at OSHA. We are meeting with um, AFL. We're meeting with uh, our grantees that have a lot to do with this, NIEHS. So we have a lot of partners out there that we've had in the past that we're going to continue to meet to make sure we get the education, the training, and the resources that you're going to need. Um, this is a, a, another one that we have. This is another issue. This is one you don't think about. You know, you pick up a patient, you go to the hospital, you drop the patient off, you don't know if that's a source patient or not with the virus, but then how do you disinfect? What do you disinfect with? What works and what doesn't work? There are so many products out there right now. Do, they, do you know they're effective? Do you know, do they kill this virus? How do they kill that virus? We have this posted, and this is something you have to look at. It's a list of all the approved EPA that will take care of that virus, and that's going to be real important because the minute you pick up that patient, you take them to the hospital, you're changing uh, your gear, you're putting your um, gear that has been exposed in that red bag in that hospital, in that emergency room in most cases, you're coming back, you're going to have to disinfect that vehicle, and then you're going to be going back in service. So all the way, all that route is to protect you, and this last piece is going to be very, very important. There, again, I can't stress, there are, so, there are a lot of resources out there. You're going to have a lot from your state. Um, you're going to have a lot um, of, uh, of information overload in some cases. But again, and I know we're stressing this, start to coordinate your plan. You know, start to make that phone call. Start to set up your committees. I mean, we didn't have all this information. We reached out to the subject matter experts that we know of to say, hey, listen, what is working out there? What's not working out there? You have to start this. There's no, there's no time for a delay on this. You just got to start this process and get it done. And we are with you every step of the way. If you need something, you can call us. If you need more information, if you think there's an FAQ that needs to get changed, if you think there's another policies and procedure, if you think that your, your collective bargaining, um, you have issues with that, we have these resources. That's what we're there for at the IFF, and these resources are for you. And please, um, look at us, um, utilize our resources, and, and we hopefully, we'll, together, we'll be able to get through this, uh, this event. Okay, with that, I'm gonna, um, we're going to shift here now. We've got two of our other components coming up. One is legislative, and this is going to be an incredibly important um, sort of presentation on what are we doing right now, what is the federal government doing, and, and how are they going to be protecting our members, and then communicating to your members. I think this is probably one of the most vital things in working for the last 12 days with communications, with legislative, both of these have the most current update. So to begin, um, we're going to have Shannon Meisner, Director of Government Affairs, to do the first presentation, followed by Mark Treglio, Assistant to the General President for Communications and Media. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. All right. Well, as um, every, every speaker that we've heard from so far has said, um, things are changing rapidly, and that is no different within the federal government and um, in Congress. So I'm going to start my presentation um, taking us way back into January. Um, it was January 31st that the Health and Human Services Department declared a public health emergency, right? So what does that mean? That basically means that um, HHS is going to have powers that they didn't have previously in order to push resources out, um, including resources through the Public Health Emergency Fund when uh, those funds are available. Um, and additionally, um, relevant to uh, state and local funding, HHS is the lead federal agency for public health, ag uh, for public health responses here. Other federal agencies are supporting HHS in this regard, um, and that's going to be relevant as to how federal resources are expanded. At the same time, 
Oh, and um, subsequent to this, CDC started to push some initial funds out um, just last week. You had small amounts of money that were being delivered to state and local jurisdictions, um, specifically for supplies, infection control, surge staffing, and other activities, and then for um, surveillance. These are uh, primarily through the public health agencies of the states. At the same time, Congress um, began to act, and we have been engaging Congress um, on uh, coronavirus since this became apparent to us. Um, specifically last week, the Congress did end up passing a emergency supplemental for coronavirus, $8.3 billion in emergency funding for the, um, among other um, things, the, um, the funds listed here, $950 million to states and localities, $500 million for medical supplies, including PPE, $300 million in contingency funding for vaccines, and then money for worker-based training. Um, that was signed into law on Friday, and um, we know that the majority of that fund is, or of those funds are probably going to flow through um, the states to the um, public, public health agencies. Um, and uh, as well as that, um, a minimum level of funding is going to go to four cities identified here, DC, New York City, Chicago, LA. This is not to say that other agencies and other uh, localities aren't going to be able to um, avail themselves of that money, but we know that a minimum amount of money is going to flow um, to the public health agencies in this manner. And there's also the possibility the Trump administration is um, discussing, we understand, or, or has considered um, declaring a um, national, a, a potential declaration of national emergency through the Stafford Act. This would open up um, disaster relief fund resources. That's quite a significant amount of money, and that would allow additional funds to flow to state and local governments. And um, we are keeping a close eye on that. Throughout this, um, throughout this process, we've been engaged both with the administration as well as Congress on priorities for fire departments. We want to make sure that local fire departments uh, have the right resources to safely and effectively respond. We heard um, so powerfully from um, uh, Washington State um, as to what their needs were, and we took those lessons seriously. So in that regard, we have been talking to folks about making sure that fire and EMS is a priority, right? That not all the funds are simply going to public health uh, departments and public health agencies. Uh, personal protective equipment. Obviously, you need to make sure you have the resources to protect yourselves so that you can uh, continue to serve the public. Training and, again, testing. And all of this is to say, um, again, that this is rapidly evolving. So as your needs become more apparent, we're going to be uh, returning to our friends in the federal government and talking to them about those needs. Um, and there's a lot that uh, state and local leaders can do to assist the IAFF in making sure these resources get out uh, to your members, get out at the state and local level. Um, on prioritization of fire and EMS, um, you know, we're advising that you talk to your governors, you talk to your mayors, state homeland security directors, state EMS directors and administrators. Um, make sure that fire and EMS is prioritized for resources, for PPE, for testing, and generally as new needs become available. Personal protective equipment. Um, we know there's a strategic national stockpile. We know that some states have stockpiles, and we know that distribution of the uh, supplies in those stockpiles is controlled by state infectious disease plans or pandemic plans. Not every state has one of those plans, but if you have one of those plans, fire and EMS may be identified as one of the um, entities that would receive resources. Um, that can be amended by the governor. Find your state infectious disease plan or pandemic plan, and we can assist you with that. If you are not on the priority on that on those lists, um, we highly suggest that you contact your governor um, and state homeland security director to get that amended. Um, and as far as shortages in strategic national stockpile, uh, HHS is uh, intending to purchase 500 million N95s. Um, 
for that stockpile. Uh, it's a guaranteed acquisition that's going to ramp up production and make sure that we have enough PPE uh, as, this, as this situation unfolds. And then lastly, um, overtime and backfill. Uh, this is important for the reasons that we heard from um, Washington State earlier, right? As more members become quarantined or isolated, we're going to have gaps. We're going to have gaps that are going to need to be filled, and um, that's going to cause uh, issues for a number of places around the country. So we've identified and we've confirmed that um, through Department of Homeland Security grant programs, the State Homeland Security Grant Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative, that funds can be used for overtime and backfill. Um, there's a couple things that need to be done in order to make that happen, though. Number one, current funds that are out need to be reprogrammed or reprioritized. This is an eligible um, entity, but you're going to need to work, or activity, but you're going to need to work with your states. You're going to need to work with your governors, or in the case of UASI, with your mayor and your urban area working group. And then secondly, FY20 applications for these programs are currently underway. So uh, work with your governor, work with your mayors, work with your urban area working group to make sure that overtime and backfill for this public health emergency is included in, in those applications. And then lastly, since a lot of you are going to the Hill today, we would recommend that you discuss these concerns with your legislators, discuss them with your senators, discuss them with your representatives. Make sure they know what challenges you're facing back home so that as you do this important work and as we continue to do this work on the Hill, that they know the firefighter's perspective and that they're able to echo those concerns um, either here with future work that we're doing on Capitol Hill, but also back home with your governors and with your mayors. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to AGP Treglio to talk a little bit about how you can continue to communicate with your members back home. Good morning. So as the IFF engages in events like uh, COVID-19, uh, we need to realize that there's a communications component to all of this. Um, everything we do is about messaging, getting out there, and we have two different ways of communications that while we're out there that we have to worry about. And our first one is internal. We always have to be a resource for our members. We have to let them know that we're out in front we're leading and we're doing everything we can to protect their safety. On the external side, we have, a, we have an obligation to insert ourselves into the story that's being out there, being told out there. For example, MSNBC is outside and they're gonna be interviewing us. And part of that is, you know, we need to understand that when you're seeing stories, it's not just what are the hospitals doing, what is the CDC doing. It's about what is the IFF doing for its members, what are firefighters and paramedics on the front lines doing every day. And that part of the message is also we're doing everything we can to keep our community safe. So you've, you saw it earlier today, you've heard all about it, and I wanted to just start out by uh, going over the, one of the first things we do to keep our members informed is the COVID-19 toolkit. Uh, the general president and the health and safety divisions, tear divisions, back in early January, before this was a major, major story out there, really took this bull by the horns and, and got communications and said, hey, let's get together, let's build this toolkit. Uh, Jane Bloom, our communications director and her team, put together a wonderful toolkit and uh, we were up and running. This was out ready for our members by early February as part of our efforts to stay out in front of all of this. Uh, as, as the virus continued to grow, we, uh, we reached out to our members via email and we have a, our email list. We were emailing 245,000 of our members, providing the links to the toolkits, providing resources for them. We, based on, based on the open rates, we're seeing a very high open rate. Our members are starting to get engaged. We're seeing 40% open rates on our emails that are coming out. Average rates for us are 25%, and even average rates in the general public on emails is 15%. So the 40% rate is really good. It's, it's our, our leaders are getting our emails, our members are getting the message, and we're starting to get there. And we're starting to work to even try and get that rate even higher. Another avenue we've been active in is social media. 
we've been using our, our uh, for a union our size, we have a very powerful social media machine. And we've been out there using that every day, trying to promote the toolkit, trying to promote the efforts that are being done at headquarters every day to show the value, to show that we're out there doing everything we can. Uh, we've just, this one post alone has reached over 51,000 people, and we've taken the extra step to, to go and digitally target our members on such an important issue. We've also harnessed the power of E18, our multimedia studio at headquarters. Uh, we had an opportunity to jump in and do a couple webinars to uh, our district leaders were out in the field holding events, and we were able to use E18 to get in there and, and discuss it. The general president led a conversation with the 8th district leadership and, and the British Columbia professional firefighters about what we're doing every day to, to keep our members safe. Now there's also an external component to this, and Doug Stern and our media relations team have been working hard on the phones every day trying to get us in these stories. And one of these was by the Wall Street Journal, where we're the largest circulating paper in the United States. And this is used as a springboard to generate additional news out there and insert firefighters and paramedics and our members into the public health narrative. As I mentioned before, you know, we don't want all of the news stories to just focus on you know, what the hospitals are doing, what government is doing. You know, we play a role in this, and it's very important that the community knows the role that we're playing. And as, as I also mentioned, you know, reminding them that we're here for them and we're doing everything in our power to keep them safe. Part of, part of that was also using E18 once again to where we had uh, Cox Media come in and they represent 10 to 20, maybe even 30 television markets across the country. We came in, our health and safety team did a great job uh, doing, showing them what we're doing out in the field every day, showing what we're teaching our members to stay safe and just get our message out there. So while we're doing everything we can, there are some tools that you can do and take home with you to, to really strengthen your internal communications. We can send out information all day long, but if it's coming to you and you're not getting the message out there, that's where we need to strengthen our role in, in keeping our members safe. So there are, but there are some things you can do to keep your members safe and, and keep a line of communications open. So you want to be able to continue to share the coronavirus toolkit with your members through all of your internal communications platform, whether it's through your Facebook groups, whether it's through your email blast, your local meetings, uh, your, the cork board at the fire station, you put out a flyer, make sure that you're still handing out our information. You could also use the information on the toolkit. As Jim mentioned earlier, we have a, a lot of misinformation on social media, a lot of people who just don't believe that we're in a, a crisis situation right now, you could take the toolkit, the information on it, and use it to combat some of that misinformation. We have 240,000 emails uh, in the database. If you're not receiving the information, if you're not, uh, if you have members saying, I haven't heard about this, maybe it's time to get them to go to iff.org, it's time to get them uh, linked into the linked into our database. It's not necessarily just to get coronavirus information. There's a lot, there's a lot more that goes in there when it comes to disaster relief and other, and other events that we participate in. So it's really important to make sure that we have your most up-to-date information and we can be able to help keep you safe with information. And most importantly, as local members, as local leaders, I'm here to remind your members that they need to keep their guard up on every run, regardless of, regardless of the nature of the call. Jim talked about, uh, or Dennis or Lawson earlier talked about how they went on a patient who fell, and when they got there, the patient had coronavirus. We had an incident in New York where the members went to a gas leak in a house, and it wasn't until they were in the house that they realized that they were dealing with a family that was in quarantine for coronavirus. So you never really know what you're getting into, but just make sure it's in the back of your head on every run that you go on. And finally, you need to let your members know that you're leading. You're working, with the, you're working for them every day. You're working with the department on the proper procedures and personal protective equipment and policies that the department's issuing and to keep them as safe as possible. And you need to let them know that your union is also making sure that the admin side of things are being taken care of, whether it's the workers' comp, uh, proper pay. You know, Washington State has a great policy when it comes to, hey, this is what we're gonna do, our members are quarantined, we're gonna take care of them. A lot of you are gonna go home and not gonna have that benefit. So you need to make sure that you're alerting your members to the fact that you're working on this every day. 
and, and you're continuing to do the best that they can so they can continue to do their jobs and keep their community safe. On that note, I'm gonna hand it back to the uh, general president and thank you for having me. And listen, uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank the hundreds of our members, as I understand, we've been live streaming this and we've had uh, a significant participation. So uh, thank you for, for joining us this morning and hopefully this has been helpful in providing you with uh, some of the critical information that uh, we all need. I'm just gonna really just close this off. Thank you for hanging in this morning. I know you've got your uh, work up on Capitol Hill now. I know you've got many uh, meetings that have been scheduled, but we did want to at least pull together uh, this morning uh, this briefing to at least empower you and, and send you home uh, with uh, the information that you're going to need uh, in order to, to deal with this uh, health care outbreak. Um, you've, you've seen all of the tools, toolkits, information, communications. I just want to remind you that, you know, you really are the subject matter experts in your community. They are looking toward you, to you uh, for your leadership in so many ways. And uh, in order to be able to do your job, just remember, this is about also protecting yourself. And this is about protecting your family. And this is about making sure that you and have your members, because you're the leaders, will follow these protocols. Um, you know, it was mentioned, we have a tendency to want to just go out there, do our job, kick the door down, come hell or high water, but this is an event that we really need to, to follow, if you will, the rules. And um, so make sure you're not just protecting yourself because in essence, you're also protecting your family. And you also want to make sure that if you come in contact, if you are exposed, uh, that you do need to follow the quarantine rules. You do need to follow uh, everything that we're trying to push out every day. And so we're going to uh, make sure that you have everything you need. Go through your uh, district vice president. Uh, they'll make sure that you're in contact with each and every one of our uh, relevant divisions and departments, depending on exactly what your request and your need is. Um, and I want to also just say that, you know, we are part of the healthcare system. And we gotta make sure government out there looks at us as such. And that as they're ramping up and as they're spending uh, the billions and billions of dollars that will be spent and as they're focused on some elements of the overall healthcare system in this country, as well as within your states and in your communities, that we have to be viewed and uh, treated as part of that system and to make sure that we're getting entitled to and provided uh, all of the uh, efforts and all of the resources and all of the funding that will go to make sure you can do your job, you have appropriate equipment, as important as anything, we are a union to make sure that we take care of our members and protect their interests. And we don't need members using their own personal time at this moment. We need governments that are going to step up and make sure that our members are resourced, treated, you know, and paid fairly for the exposures that they're likely going to be engaged with in simply doing their job. So, have a productive day. Thanks for hanging in. Thank you, uh, everybody that's been watching today. We'll continue to push this information out literally every day. It's evolving, changing. Keep coming back to the website to be updated. See you tonight. Congressional reception. <laughs>